In a minute, we'll talk to Philip Blonde. He's from the think tank Respublica. He'll uh, tell us what's caught his eye. But first, let's have a look at some of the uh, stories that are making the headlines today. First of all, we've got the Observer for you this morning and uh, a couple of stories on here, but one is around um, now Clinton is uh, telling Britain you should stay in the EU. Hillary Clinton is uh, throwing her weight behind the campaign. Interesting one this because, of course, Barack Obama's had an opinion on it, now Hillary Clinton. And then we've got Boris Johnson, uh, who is obviously in the, the Leave campaign, saying they should keep their nose out, essentially. So that's uh, one of the stories in the Observer for you this morning. Let's have a look at the front page of uh, the Daily Telegraph today. They've got uh, that picture of uh, President Obama and the Prime Minister in a golf buggy, uh, one of them at the uh, steering wheel. It says, look who's in the driving seat. But the story next to it uh, talks about the junior doctor's strike. Pregnant women hit by NHS strike chaos is their headline. They also say that cancer patients are suffering too after treatment has been postponed due to the junior doctors walkout or those we've been reporting. There is a, a plan, a scheme, a suggestion to try to uh, avoid this week's two-day strike. Uh, in the Sunday Times this morning, again, a picture of Barack Obama there and also a story on the super rich. And this is, of course, their annual rich list they put together. <laughs> and it's in Britain's super rich have suffered the worst hammering for their fortunes since the financial crisis. And it's interesting to see how it's changed in terms of the top people with people like Lakshmi Mittal, who is, of course, big steel boss, uh, who's lost a fair bit of money because of everything that's been going on in the commodities sector. You need about 150 odd million, I think, if I remember rightly, in order to get You're into the You're not quite the there yet, then, are you, Roger? Yeah, struggling, <laughs> struggling along. Uh, Good morning, Philip. Nice Good to morning. see you. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. Um, let's have a look at some of the stories you've, uh, you've picked out. You're talking about British troops in Libya, which is uh, inside the Telegraph as well. What's, uh, what are they saying about that? Well, it's a, it's a fascinating story, really. We've got the whole of, kind of Europe's southern border is teetering on the edge of instability. You've got fundamentalist in Islamic insurgencies taking place across the piece, uh, really. And Libya, which is very close to Italy, has just had uh, a new government installed that it hopes desperately to be able to stabilise. And we absolutely, it's fundamental for the security of Europe that we stabilise uh, Libya. And it looks like the British are going to send a thousand troops uh, over there to help train local forces. Mm. And uh, we may indeed be uh, sort of sending jets over with, our, uh, with for other European countries. Um, what we don't want is a repeat in Libya uh, of what's happened in Syria, where we didn't intervene. It spiralled out of control and we can't hand another huge country over to Islamic State. And, History would suggest, and if we just stand back and do nothing, that's what will happen. And the critics, of course, will say a thousand troops there, albeit to train, is tantamount to boots on the ground. Not quite the same thing, but... Well, look, are we, are we serious about fighting the Islamic insurgency on our, on our southern border? Uh, if we are, they can only be fought by troops on the ground. The best way to fight is really to create local forces that can drive them out. After mm. all, when the Americans won against al-Qaeda uh, during the, the awakening. That's what they did. We haven't been able to do it in Syria because we've got no good allies. What we do have in Libya is the possibility of allies that the European and Western forces can back. So there's a chance. And actually, all of our security depends on it. So I think it's the right move and, and needed. And indeed, we should have probably attempted something earlier, especially after the, the Franco-British intervention that toppled Gaddafi. Mm. Mm. Let's have a look at a couple of the other stories as well that have caught your eye. And one here about uh, Austrian politics and the fact that there could be a bit of a regime change, essentially, it's in quite Austria. interesting. We don't often do Austrian yeah. politics, do we? It's good. Well, Austria has been governed for nigh on 30 years years by a grand coalition between the left and the right and if even Austria is toppling and looks like falling prey to kind of the new insurgent tide then things really are changing so what we see across Europe is a whole range of voters who feel that their concerns aren't really being um, followed and pursued by the elite that's in power. So we could either have a gun-toting far right-wing governing Austria as president, it's a ceremonial role but it's kind of really indicative, or a green. So what you're seeing really is Europe becoming more and more in, unstable as a result of the migrant crisis. And so the instability we see around the world, it's really coming home.
Yeah, and it's that division, isn't it, within the country to do with that, which makes it very interesting. Um, front page of the Times and indeed Inside, we've, we've been reporting this uh, yeah. suggestion by Labour to try and avert the junior doctor's strike and, and perhaps bring a resolution to it. Just explain what they're, what they're proposing. and what... Well, what the Labour shadow minister has suggested, with the support of the College of Surgeons and former Tory government minister Dan Poulter, is that we pilot the new doctor's contract in certain areas to actually show if the fears of doctors are actually groundless and if what the government wants to achieve in terms of having higher staffing in hospitals uh, actually is achievable and, and increases, you know, stops more people dying at the weekends. I actually personally think the doctor's dispute isn't really what is wrong with our health service. Our health service is facing multiple problems from when you're picked up by an ambulance to sending people home. We're in a systemic crisis. 70% of all NHS bed days are people with chronic disease, mm. diabetes, obesity, depression, and our service isn't designed to solve them. So really, I think the government needs to sidestep this issue because this issue is really complex. I've been studying it for, for months, and actually I think the government's got a good case, but I think the doctors are really upset about things other than the contract, and this has become the vehicle through which Mm. Their unhappiness with their loss of status, the sense of crisis has been expressed. So if the government can sidestep it, I think piloting it is actually a good it's, idea. It's about, yeah, and we can stop the conflict and actually look at the questions we're not asking about our NHS. Our NHS is no longer fit for purpose. I think, you know, we need a visionary intervention that actually people have called for a royal commission, for example, to look at the type of health service we need. Mm. We're not spending enough. The European average is about 12% of GDP. The NHS is about 9%. Mm. But there's other things that are wrong. How we treat people, the diseases we treat, We've got the, a 19th century system and we need a 21st kind of, century kind system. Kind of thing we could sit here and discuss all morning, couldn't yes, we? Yes, happy we'll, to do so. We'll, <laughs> and we will, of course, be covering that this week on the programme we as will. well. Thank Thanks you very much. It. Thanks for coming in. Now, Philip Blonde from the think tank Risk Publica is here to tell us what's caught his eye. We're going to speak to you in a minute, Philip. Thank you very much for joining us. But first, let's have a quick look at the front covers, and we're going to start with The Observer. Indeed, front page of The Observer this morning has a picture of Barack Obama, who we've just been hearing from, of course, talking to Hugh Edwards. Uh, Hillary Clinton, though, has uh, waded into the uh, EU referendum debate. She apparently telling Britain, you should stay in the European Union. And then uh, in the Sunday Telegraph this morning, a picture of um, David Cameron and Barack Obama on a golf buggy. Uh, but then the main story here is about pregnant women, saying heavily pregnant women and cancer sufferers are among uh, more than 125,000 NHS patients whose hospital treatment has been postponed amid the chaos of the first ever all-out strike by junior doctors. The uh, Sunday Times has also got a picture of Barack Obama on the front page, urging young people to vote in the EU referendum. Their main story, though, it's the one they generate every year, but it, it continues to fascinate. Uh, the Sunday Times rich list is out today. The super rich, you'll be sorry to hear, uh, hit by a slump in fortunes this year. And in the Sunday Mirror this morning, uh, a story about Prince, of course, uh, a ceremony for him yesterday, and we can see a picture of his sister, there who's making her way into a car after the ceremony. Philip, let's get inside the, inside the, uh, the papers. Uh, legal aid cuts, um, a travesty, it says, in the Observer, leading to uh, DIY defence, just to explain. Well, I just thought it was an interesting little piece in the Observer, not least because, you know, the Prime Minister has talked about the, the need to correct what's wrong in the criminal justice system. We have a reformer in Michael Gove who has already spoken, you know, rightly and movingly about what needs to be done. But something is happening that isn't good. Um, mm. We have over 25% of people who come up before magistrates courts not being represented. There was one case, according to the report, where the defendant didn't say anything down the video link, was sent to prison, and only afterwards they found out he was deaf. Um, so we are, you know, fundamental to, to kind of British liberty and British justice is the idea of, of proper legal representation mm. in court. And actually what we're finding is 
is for the relatively poor, for those who can't afford it. Um, access to law is now governed by wealth, and that can't be right. So I look forward to the government's proposals to actually address this. And it, you know, the, the attempt to cut legal aid has, in fact, stopped people getting access to legal services. And, you know, that can't be right, uh, whatever point you are on the party political spectrum. Mm. Um, another story which you've picked out here, <clears throat> which is in the Sunday Express, is, is about a BBC documentary looking at what happened to the MH17 flight, which was uh, which, which tragically crashed over Ukraine, didn't it? And there's been lots of kind of what happened, and this is a new documentary with evidence suggesting a, a different theory to what people thought. Yeah, this is interesting. Uh, I, I picked this out because there's an enormous amount of Russian propaganda, Russian finance propaganda being pumped through in the West. Mm. Um, we know that the Russians are funding all sorts of uh, political parties on, on the extremes. You know, uh, the Front National in France uh, have admitted their, their financing comes from Russia. And a lot of our media operations, one of the key points is who shot down this it was a terrible tragedy. Uh, 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 a Malaysian airliner was shot down over Ukraine. Established opinion has it that it was by a, a Russian anti-aircraft missile. But now we've got the BBC doing a documentary that tries to suggest it was a Ukrainian fighter. And it just tells you, I think, and why it's interesting for us is, is the messaging and the, and, and the contestment over kind of what's happening, what's happening with Russia. Because Europe isn't only threatened on, uh, on its southern border, it's threatened on its eastern border. And we, we have to take this with a pinch of salt, I think, and think, where does it come from and whose who's interest does it lie? But I look forward to seeing the documentary. It's interesting they say Ukrainian fighter jet. Not, it's not a Russian fighter jet. It seems completely inexplicable uh, uh, to me and, and for all, from everything I know, and I, I, I do a lot of work in, in the area, they've fairly rock-solid evidence it was a Russian uh, uh, anti-aircraft missile. Mm. But look, let, let's read it. But I think it shows into sharp relief. We know that the Russian intelligence services are funneling money to Western political parties and to Western uh, media outlets. Um, for, for political uh, for political reasons. And that documentary is going out on the 3rd of May on BBC Two at 9. Right. Um, the Times has got a story about Game of Thrones. Um, explain. Well, this is the real news, I think, uh, this Sunday. Perhaps the most important inside story. What I liked about the article in the Sunday Times is it suggests that, J that Jon Snow might not be dead. This isn't the Channel 4 news anchor. Which was uh, my first. Um, uh, you know, I don't want to disturb <laughs> anyone. Charlie uh, Good uh, News, he's excellent. Uh, 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 breakfast. Um, it's actually that maybe he... Dead doesn't mean dead in Game of Thrones, as I'm sure all your viewers know. Is he going to be resurrected by a high priestess? Will he come back through some other arcane way? It, shouldn't, it seems dreadfully depressing because what, what Game of Thrones is about is essentially power without goodness. People who uh, have no moral direction, just exercising rampage, death and murder. And Jon Snow was our one hope, I think, um, uh, for a good ending. And now the poor guy's <laughs> been massacred by his own men. So we all must hope he returns, living or dead. Come back. Yeah, he Come was, back, John Snow. Uh, he was on the sofa not that long ago, obviously the actor who plays uh, the part. And he John was Snow. alive. And he, he was, was alive. definitely alive, but that's yeah. what everyone kept asking him. Are you going to be alive? You know, and, you and the thing is, is everyone's talking about his length of hair, because apparently he hasn't altered his haircut. Um, so... Yeah. Aficionados tell me that means that, that there's means still a something. role. There's still a role for him. He's still in. in, oh, in you know, it's a good way to look at it. It is. In shape <laughs> for the role, shall we say? Uh, thank you very much, Philip. Thanks for coming a in pleasure. to join us this morning. Thank you. Right.